The killings of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman are crimes that remain unsolved. The opinions expressed in this series represent just some of the many conceivable scenarios regarding how those crimes may have occurred. Jason Simpson has never been questioned or charged in relation to these crimes, and he has not made any public statements about any allegations regarding his involvement. We encourage viewers to reach their own conclusions. Previously, I'm convinced O.J. never committed this murder, but it was O.J.'s son, Jason Lamar Simpson. That's a lot. If the facts don't line up, we're going to say bump. Let me show you his supposed alibi. It's his time card. He checked in at 2.30 and out at 10.30. And you said before that time card is murky. I'm telling you, it's just not sitting right in here. This is the weapon that killed the both Simpson around Goldman. It belongs to Jason. There's no evidence to tie Jason Simpson to anything. It's a positive reaction. There's something that just came up. This could be a game changer. Nicole's watch was broken and stopped at 9.59 p.m. This is totally contrary to the timeline of the murders. That is false. It says operable. It was working. We have two sets of bloody shoe prints. And even if you took the position of one of them is O.J. Simpson, who the hell is the other one? That's the two supposed to have ACC'd it. We only come to about 6.5 cc. Is there any doubt that there were two cars that Rocky had? Not at all. He said, you know, I couldn't have done this alone. I said, okay, let's call this person Charlie. There was another person in the Bronco? Yes, that person was Jason Simpson. Are you willing to take a polygraph test? Yes. The criminal trial of O.J. Simpson is perhaps the most infamous court case of the 20th century. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Only the assailant or assailants know exactly what happened on the night of June the 12th, 1994, to turn Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman into innocent victims. I will never see my son again. Now, more than 20 years later, Bill Deere and his team of investigators have uncovered a potential eyewitness named Michael Martin, whose controversial testimony could significantly alter this case. I noticed what appeared to be two African-American males inside the vehicle. You're saying that there was another person in the Bronco? Yes, there was a passenger when the Bronco drove up and parked behind Nicole's residence. That person was Jason Simpson. But is Michael Martin telling the truth? To find out, the team has set up a test with renowned polygraph examiner, Dr. Louis Rovner. Will he catch Martin in a lie or validate his account? This is what you wrote about what you saw that night. Okay. And if you would be kind enough, I'd like you to read it aloud. Okay. On the night of June 12th, 1994, I was sitting in my car at approximately 10.15 p.m. that night. I saw a white Ford Bronco turn off Bundy onto Dorothy Street. I noticed what appeared to be two African-American males in the vehicle. Dr. Rovner is conducting what's called a specific issue test. In this type of test, if even one detail of Michael Martin's statement is a lie, his entire testimony will be deemed false. This statement is completely true. Okay. There's no way he's gonna pass. There's no way. There's no way this guy saw all of this and he's telling the truth. There's no way. The test is about to begin. Do you intend to answer the relevant questions truthfully? Yes. What do y'all think? I think he's got good control over himself. Did you ever do anything that was illegal or immoral? No. Is your written statement completely true? Yes. She's locked in now? Yeah. Are we in California? Yes. Did you deliberately lie in your written statement? No. He still looks like he's totally at ease. 
Well, it was a calm or a, uh, doing some countermeasures. It's always something I think about any polygraph. If a person's doing some behavioral technique to try to reduce their responses. In the last 48 hours, have you used any illegal drugs? No. Is he his eyes shut? It's like in a zone. Is there anything at all in your written statement that is untrue? Okay, we're done. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, let me just. Uh, turn. I still believe the LAPD has overlooked a major suspect right from the very beginning, and today, Michael Martin can prove that. Okay, I conducted a polygraph test. It was a thorough and complete procedure, and after analyzing the data that we collected on this test, there were no anomalies at all. It's my conclusion that he passed. Mr. Martin is telling the truth. I didn't see that one coming at all. However, just because Michael Martin believes he's telling the truth about what he thinks he saw that night doesn't mean that that's what actually happened. I was skeptical about Michael Martin, but after he passed the polygraph test, we needed to take what he told us a lot more seriously. This is going to get really interesting. With this explosive new eyewitness account, the investigators head back to see former LAPD detective Tom Lang to share this new evidence and learn how he would proceed. Okay, what's up? We interviewed a guy who came out of the woodwork, I'm not gonna lie to you. Apparently, he was a private investigator at the time of the murders. He shows up, he's parked there, he's looking for a, a female in a white Mercedes. While he's there, he observes the Bronco with no headlights on, pull right into the alleyway and parks behind Bundy. According to him, he sees O.J. Simpson exit the driver's side of the vehicle, and while doing so, he's walking around the back of the Bronco, putting on gloves. The bigger part of the story is he said that he clearly saw a second person in the vehicle who hopped over to the driver's seat. O.J. comes back out, gets in the passenger side of the Bronco, and leaves. He actually says that he recognized the guy that was inside the Bronco as being Jason Simpson. Now, before you say anything, we were skeptical, and we actually had him take a polygraph test, and he passed. So I want to know your take on that. Polygraphs can be used as evidence if both sides agree and the court says it's okay. We all know that type of thing, but they are not evidence. They're a tool, okay? It's fine that he passed it. To me, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Where was this guy 22 years ago? It's as simple as that. Well, let me ask you a bigger question then. If this guy was willing to go to the LAPD and tell them exactly what he told us, do you think this is something the LAPD should look into? I would be curious, if nothing else, and it would be investigated without question. But again, I would probably be able to eliminate this guy really quick. And the only way to do that would be to what? To absolutely do anything we could to either prove or disprove it. The fact that Tom Lang, one of the lead detectives on the original investigation, said that the LAPD would have looked into Michael Martin's account further, told me we were on the right track. We should be doing everything we can to validate Michael Martin's account or rule it out. And that means seeing how his statement holds up against everything we already know about this case. The investigators have asked Bill Deere to meet up with them so that they can examine how Michael Martin's polygraph statement matches up with the blood evidence collected by the LAPD. So let's just go through the whole scenario of what Michael Martin told us now and see how it lines up. All right, so from what Michael Martin tells us, O.J. Simpson's driving, Jason Simpson's in the passenger seat as they pull up to the alleyway of Bundy, right? That's right. They park, O.J. Simpson gets out of the driver's side, shuts the door, starts to walk around the back of the Bronco. While he's doing that, he's putting on the gloves. And we know Michael Martin's over in this direction, so he's got a clear shot of OJ. He walks around, Jason's still in the passenger seat at this point, walking up to the back gate of Bundy, and he disappears. New sight of him. However, Jason Simpson hops from the passenger seat over to the driver's seat, right? That's right. About five minutes pass, OJ Simpson comes back out from the Bundy gate. Now, he's got his clothes in his left hand, and He's in his boxers. That's right. Walks up to the car. Is this where the blood transfer happened? Makes sense. Maybe. Either from the clothes or from his hand. Correct. Some way, OJ rubs up against this door as he's opening it to get inside. Gets in the passenger side, shuts the door. This could also explain the blood on the back of the passenger seat. Cast off from the crime scene. Bingo. So at some point, he drops off Jason. Somebody's got to still drive the truck to Rockingham. OJ hops over the center console, over to the driver's seat. This is how we get the blood transfer onto the stairwell, onto the pedals. Now, as OJ's driving to Rockingham, he gets there and there's a sense of urgency. Grabs the clothes, puts his forearm here, pushes the door open, explaining how you get the blood transfer on the armrest itself. It's out of the vehicle, 
And this is how the bloody knuckle hits the handle. Not when he's getting in the Bronco, but when he's exiting. Any holes you have, any questions you have, Michael Martin's testimony explains them. It just didn't make sense to me that if there was only one person in the Bronco, why was there all that blood evidence on the other side of the vehicle? It makes much more sense that if there's blood on the passenger side of the vehicle, there was probably a passenger. This provides an explanation for the blood on the outside of the passenger door, the blood on the passenger seat, the blood on the passenger side of the console. I think what it does, it makes a lot stronger case that at some point, two people were in this vehicle as opposed to just one. And it could have been Jason Simpson. Michael Martin's statement is making sense of things we've never been able to make sense of before. No one knows for sure what happened in the Bronco that night, but it's interesting to see how things appear to be lining up. The Los Angeles Police Department quickly determined that Jason Simpson's alibi for the night of June the 12th, 1994, ruled him out as a suspect in the murders of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. You were working on the night of June 12th? Yeah. When did you leave work? I think, I think it was around 10, 10, 30. But Carlos Ramos, a co-worker of Jason's at Jackson's restaurant, suggests he may have left earlier that night. I was a busboy at that time. So I remember for sure we're closed at the kitchen at 9. By 9 o'clock, you know, kitchen was closed. That time we wouldn't get more people. The time card from Jackson's seems to support Jason's deposition statement. But because a portion of it is handwritten, Bill Deere believes the card is nothing more than Jason's attempt to fabricate an alibi. Michael Martin's statement has supported the theory that Jason could have been involved in the murders. Now the team must re-examine the timeline of Jason's night to see whether it was even physically possible for him to be at the crime scene when Bill says the murders occurred. Last time we tried to replicate Jason's possible route for the night of the murders, it was during weekday traffic, and we didn't even come close to doing it in the time frame that Jason would have had. So we had to do it again, but this time on a Sunday night. So here we go, daytime. It took us 48 minutes and change, right? Right. On Sunday nights at Jackson's Restaurant, kitchen closed by 9, chefs were out of there shortly after, so between 9 and 9.30. Let's call it 9.30 just to make it the most conservative test of right. our two theories. Right. So we got to leave at 9.30 on the dot from Jackson's. We're going to be moving here as if we're dropping off Jason's girlfriend. Did you go into her apartment at all? No, I didn't. I just kissed her in the car and she went out. She went out. And then guess what? I'm hauling ass. You're hauling ass to ultimately end up at the Bundy residence. Bill Deere believes that after Jason dropped off his girlfriend, he rushed to Nicole's condo on Bundy and committed the murders. According to Bill's theory, Nicole's watch was broken at the exact time of the assault. 9.59 p.m. The assault happened at 9.59. That's got to give him a couple minutes before that to get there. So he's got to be there no later than 9.55 p.m. Exactly. Give him some time to get out of the car, walk up the door, have a confrontation happen, and right. then something violent to stop that right. watch. Bill believes that Nicole's watch stopped at 9.59 p.m. Jason gets off the restaurant at a particular time, and he'd have to be able to leave the restaurant, drop off his girlfriend, and get to Bundy if he did this by himself within about 25 minutes. We're not going to stop here for very long, because what we're going to do next, we're going to test the Charlie theory. The Charlie theory comes from O.J.'s book, If I Did It. In it, he describes a second person he calls Charlie, who showed up at his Rockingham residence to alert him of troubling news regarding his estranged wife. The two then left in the infamous white Bronco to confront Nicole. And on the Charlie theory with Jason as Charlie, he's going to keep going on okay. all the way up to Rockingham. And under this theory, he's got to be there by about 10.05. Right, so that gives us 35 minutes. You get there, you get out of the car, rile OJ up, back down to Bundy by 10.15, which lines up with Michael Martin's testimony. Exactly. You can accept every piece of information that Jason's the killer. But if you can't physically get from point A to point B to point C in that time frame, it doesn't matter. You're talking cutting the time in half. Uh, it may seem impossible, but it's a completely different city after dark on a Sunday. There's only one way to find out. What the hell do we got to lose, right? Let's go. Ready? Three, two, one, go.
What's your take on this whole thing so far? Just a couple things bugging me, like this whole conspiracy of the right. police planting evidence, I'm not buying it. Right, the other thing that I was thinking about is, what was OJ's motivation? Why this night? What set him off? And that's why the Charlie theory has some weight to me. However, you got the bloody finger. It lines up perfectly with the fact that he was the actual murderer and he cut the finger during the actual incident. And the blood? And the blood. The trickling of the blood found at the scene was indicative of somebody who was dripping blood as they were leaving. Mochi's blood found at the crime scene does not fit with Bill's theory. No. Let's make this light. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and, and the other thing is, that time card's really bugging me, is it? Depending on how you want to see that card is how you can manipulate it to look. That's yeah, the way I see yeah, it. Yeah. The handwriting thing. Is it just a common practice that the restaurant right. always uses? Or is it something that was done deliberately to deceive somebody? So there's some unanswered questions that I don't think line up with Bill's theory. And I realize I have to dot every I across every T because there's people's lives at stake here. And we could affect them dramatically based on our conclusions. We'll be looking for Stanley. It's right. coming up fast. Stanley's right there. Stanley's the light. Yep, so we're going past all these people. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Ready, set, going. Right. Two blocks on the left, but it'll be the second stop sign, I think. It's this one right here. It's this one right here. Okay, let's see. House. So I'm dropping her off. She's out of the car, and we're off. We're at. 6.22. Oof. We gotta really be moving. 25 minutes. But if Bill's right, he's pissed off. He wants to get there. He's got something to get off his chest. Thinking they stood me up. I just made all this food for everybody. Now you decided yep. not to come. I'm gonna show you. And he's gonna get her back. And this is how he's right. gonna do it. And he's filled with rage right now. This is how he'd be driving. He's going in oh, and yeah. out of traffic. He's he's going through yellow lights. He's not obeying the speed limit. Guess what? We're at Wilshire Boulevard. 15 minutes. We've got 10 minutes to get the money. It's gonna be closing. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Ready? Set. Go. Go, 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 go. To get from Jackson's to the girlfriend's house and then all the way to Bundy, that's a lot of mileage to cover. This looks dubious at best, if not impossible. We're um, making this light. Green, green, green. Green, green, green. Come on. Come on. 23 minutes, 22 seconds, and we are in Brentwood. I don't know that we're going to make 25. I'm going, desert, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. Here's Bundy. It's going to be easy. Really close. Go up, go up, go up. Yeah. Dorothy's coming up next, I think. Slow down, slow down. Here's around this curve. Here's Dorothy, and then right into the alley. It is 25.58. I can't believe we made that. I can't believe it either. Wow. We made the drive to Nicole's condo on Bundy in under 26 minutes, proving that Jason could have done the drive in the same amount of time. At this point, I was hoping we could shoot something down. But all theories as to what happened that night are still in play. We made it the hardest route possible, possible in the smallest time frame possible. That's right. And we still did it. So under the Charlie theory, he's got to get from Jackson's drop off his girlfriend and up to Rockingham and stay there just for a couple minutes, long enough to have a conversation with OJ, get him all riled up. We are on sunset at 29 minutes. Here's Here Rockingham. Rockingham right here. There we go. You know the area, you know where you're going. That even takes a couple seconds off. Exactly. All right. It's going to be in the next block. We're almost there. Slow down. Here. 31 minutes, 21 seconds. Wow. 3121. It doesn't even matter what theory you believe in. If you believe in the first theory that Jason's the sole killer, he had plenty of time to get from the girlfriend's apartment all the way to Bundy. And if you believe in theory two, the Charlie theory, that's right. He goes from the girlfriend's apartment all the way to Rockingham. That puts him here by 10.05. Right, which gives Jason plenty of time to have that conversation with OJ at the gate. Yep. Get him all riled up, whatever he said. They're in the Bronco, off to Bundy by 10.15. Right, that, that's when Michael Martin sees him. Wow. You know what? That gives us a lot to think about. Yep. the drive in the allotted time frame has reopened the question of whether Jason Simpson was involved in the murders. 
So today, Chris and Derek are heading back to see Fred Goldman and Tanya Brown to bring them up to date on their investigation and to see if they can shed any new light on what happened that fateful night. Fred, thanks for meeting with me again. We have found possible evidence that somebody else was involved in what happened to your son and Nicole. Okay. I'm curious as to what that conclusion in specifics is. There was an eyewitness that claimed that they saw two people in the Bronco at the Bundy location that evening at about 10, 15, 10, 17. Okay. Curious why this individual never came forward. That is very curious. And he did see O.J. Simpson, but he also saw a second person in the vehicle. I was skeptical. So we brought him to one of the top polygraph examiners in the state of California. He passed. And I'll tell you, your reaction is what my reaction was. There was some evidence, I believe, by the limo driver of another vehicle at the Rockingham location. There's a couple theories about the second person who could have been. Have you heard some of the names? Honestly, I know you're going to throw Jason in there. Well, what's your thought? Never. No chance. No chance. Everybody loved Nicole, and Nicole loved everybody. Right. And nothing actually breaks my heart more knowing that people think that, especially when it comes to Jason. Mm -hmm. That really, really breaks my heart because he loved Nicole and she loved him, but not like in a crazy like that. It was like, you're my son. No. Anytime that anybody attacks Jason, that's what, that, that just breaks my heart. I've always looked at it in terms of the evidence that was presented, the killer's hair and fibers on Ron, Ron's hair and the Bronco, Ron's hair uh, on the socks that were in the killer's house. My belief is that he did it, he did it alone, he did it with malice and no afterthought. Nicole had a watch on that night. There are people that believe that watch indicates when she may have been assaulted, that it was broken. Have you ever seen the photo of her watch? I have the watch. You have the watch? Mm -hmm. It's in my safe. Was that watch broken? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. It was broken. It was broken. Tanya's emotional defense of Jason really had an effect on me. But what also struck me was the fact that Nicole's watch is broken. I couldn't believe it. Bill's whole theory that Jason committed the murders could be right. Tanya told you that Nicole's watch was broken? Not only was it broken, she still has the thing. It's in her safe. I mean, that changes everything. I know. I was thinking the same thing when she said it. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what Alan Park told us about that second car being parked behind the Bentley at Rockingham. Me too. I noticed a couple cars parked in this area here. And from the length of the limousine, I didn't feel that I could make that turn. And you're positive. You saw two cars. That's correct. I don't know what to make of that. Me neither. It's time to talk to Bill. After a string of surprising revelations, Chris, Derek, and Bill returned to base camp to see if these findings shed any new light on the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. But first, the team must follow up on the last piece of unresolved evidence, the knife. I found this knife in Jason Simpson's box inside that public storage facility. I believe this is the weapon that killed Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, and it belongs to Jason Lamar Simpson. We have isolated threads for DNA extraction. We'll do additional testing to try to determine whether it is blood or not, and then we'll see if we can isolate DNA from the material in it. If the DNA on Jason Simpson's knife is in fact blood and can be matched, the team may finally be able to link him to the heinous crimes committed on June 12, 1994. This is Mark Taylor speaking. It's Derek. I'm here with Chris and Bill. We wanted to hear what you got. Well, what we've got is we've got a mixture of DNA we know for sure it's at least three people. I suspect it's probably four, but maybe even five or six people. So it's a complex mixture. And so when we see this kind of thing, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to interpret what that profile means. Do we know if that DNA is 
from blood? We got an indication that blood is present on the scabbard. Is it possible to get a DNA profile from that blood? As a matter of fact, I don't think you can do that. What's the likelihood that you could match it? Well, under no circumstance could we match it. From an investigative standpoint, it's of limited utility. That's what you're telling us, it sounds like. That's correct. I think you just opened up a lot more questions for us, actually, but we'll be back in touch if we, we need anything else. Thanks, Mark. All right, take Thank care. You. All these weeks, we're waiting to hear the results on this knife. And for all we know, Bill's DNA could be on it. Um, the storage unit owner could have been on it when they were doing the auctions. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. The knife's a question mark. We definitely can't conclude that it was the knife used. It's uncertain. He couldn't rule out the knife that we presented him. I still believe that this could, in fact, be the knife involved in the murders. More conclusive results of the DNA testing of the knife could have answered a lot of our questions. But even without it, I felt like we had what we needed. Well, that's everything. I mean, we've talked to so many people. We've done our investigation. And I think we're ready to give you our conclusions now, Bill. I'm ready no matter what. Let's get it on. So let's start with the blood evidence. Let's acknowledge the fact that there were 1.5 cc's of blood missing, right? Of OJ's blood. Of OJ's blood missing. Let's go with it. Do we know how small of amount 1.5 cc's is? Well, keep it's it. like this. It's small. So let me go with this, right? Van Etter gets it. How would Van Etter have dropped this blood at all those locations without being seen? Not to mention, there was clearly a mixture of his blood with the victims. You can't manipulate the fact that their blood was mixed. Period. Did the blood have EDTA in it? What does that matter? Think about it. What Henry Lee said to both of you have to respect. We have EDTA found on the blood sample. Wow. The worst case scenario here is purposeful planting. planting. Reason I think that it's not uh, a fair allegation or an accurate one is that EDTA uh, occurs naturally in the body, but apart from that, it's not just OJ's blood that's on those socks, that's right. it's Nicole's blood. There is like no that. evidence to support any blood planting in this case. Oh, I think you're wrong. All right, what about those two bloody shoe prints? That's where we kind of pivoted to actual information that maybe doesn't link a specific person there, but indicates that there may have been a second person at the crime scene. We found possible two tracks of the shoe print. So you're saying right in that picture, you have two sets of shoe prints. Yes, it's with line design. Tom Lang, he had an answer for that, which was the corduroy clothing that Ron Goldman was wearing. Actually, the print actually matched. And that there had been some testing done to determine that. Right. Henry Lee is dead wrong, okay? We had Bill Bodziak look at the photographs that Henry pointed out and told us without any exception it was a fabric impression from ron goldman's shirt and blood as he was rolling around it almost looked like a whole shoe print that doesn't exist what did lang say as far as the second person i mean obviously he doesn't believe at all that there was a second person there and i can see where he's coming from but here's the thing he couldn't explain the blood on the passenger side of the bronco he couldn't explain Michael Martin's testimony. And he actually said if these things had came up 20 years ago, he would have investigated to the fullest degree. I mean, then there's this whole Charlie theory that OJ puts out there in this book. Lines up with what Alan Park tells us about a second vehicle being at Rockingham when he arrived there before OJ got back to the estate. It supports Michael Martin's it does, observations. Absolutely. And then there's the broken wash, okay? That's an indicator for when the assaults allegedly occurred at 9.59 p.m. Prior to O.J. Simpson getting there, correct? Yeah. Tanya told me she still has the watch, and she did indicate it was broken. You want my opinion? I don't think the watch says anything. I think it's a red herring. I think when Tanya said the watch was broken, I think that went to the exact issue of what we've been looking at. We know now, because of the fact you've driven that, that it only takes 25 minutes to get to the Bundy address. And if the watch was broken, and it broke at 9.59, when he hits her, and when he does, she falls to the floor on the concrete, causing the watch to hit on the left side, and the watch stopped. And then we have our eyewitness saying it's 10.15 when he sees the Bronco come off the Bundy onto Dorothy. Why couldn't that be Jason Simpson was the killer? And OJ came on to the scene at a later time. I'm not going just theory, I'm based on the facts. And I think that's why we have to move on to Jason's alibi, because we could debate the watch. It's all about the alibi. And I think that goes down to Jason's time card. And I want to bring something up for you guys that I've been kind of working on, and I want your opinion on it. I'm just going to lay it out, hear me out on it with an open mind, and see what you think. Bill's theory hinges on an extremely tight timeline, and it's all based on the idea that Jason forged his time card to create an alibi. I've had a problem with this time card from the very beginning, and I finally think I figured out why that was. 
We could debate the watch. It's all about long. the alibi. And I think that goes down to Jason's time card. And I want to bring something up for you guys that I've been kind of working on, and I want your opinion on it. I'm just going to lay it out, hear me out on it with an open mind, and see what you think. So based on the theory, this card is a weekly pay period. And if it's true, then that means that this date here would be Monday, this would be Sunday, ending on 619. And you would look at it and say, well, wouldn't this be Monday? But the belief is that Jason didn't have a chance to punch out on his previous time card for that Sunday night, the night of the murders. So he had to fill in, handwrite his time in for the murder night here to not only give himself an alibi, but to account for his hours with the restaurant. So this is our murder right here, 612. That would make this night 614, 615, and this would be 618. Right. Let's apply some levels of scrutiny to this, though, and see if it matches up, okay? First off, Jason Simpson said after the murders, he took some time off. Did you quit your job that week, by the way? I didn't quit, no. They gave me some time off. From the 12th or the 13th to the 17th, I had friends like move all my stuff into my dad's house. Because once he went away, I had moved into the house. So the first problem I found with this card was the fact that if this is a guy who just found out that his stepmother has been killed, it's highly unlikely that you're going to work four days following the night of the murders. Let's say he did work. Would he have worked after being involved in a very publicized vehicle pursuit with his father, where his father almost took his own life, and then work the following two days? Well, plus their funeral was in there. The funeral was in between there as well, so completely un impossible? No, but highly unlikely for most of us. The co-owner says he asked for the time card that would include the night of the murders. That's what he has here. But he said that he received that card one to two days after the murders occurred. And you would say that in your best recollection, this time card was brought to you by the co-owner within one or two days of the actual murders. Yes. You know, again, it's been a long time. I don't think he ran over to show me a time card from two weeks ago. It was relevant that this was that time card for that night. That means he would have received it probably around Wednesday. So let's say he gets it after the Wednesday night shift. He gets it Thursday morning. There's no way he could have future dates of Saturday and Sunday already punched on that card. So that can't be 618 or 619. It cannot be 618, so it's a couple different things. When you look at that, then explain to me, okay, why he would handwrite that thing at the top when we've already established... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me get to that. Let's apply what I feel this card actually represents, okay? What if this card is not a weekly time card, but a bi-weekly time card? This right here is what leads me to that. I believe this is side A of a side A and B time card. And even though this is the front side, you would still have the bi-weekly ending date on the front of the card to represent that. Well, if I'm correct, the B side would actually represent 613 through 619. That's the B side. This would be the A side. If I'm correct, this would be 66, this would be 67, 68, and then we would have 611, 612. So when the co-owner asked the copy of this time card, Correct. he did not ask for both sides. He only asked for one side. Does that really make sense? Based on what Jason said, he said he didn't work the week following the murders. We don't have the B side of this card because in my belief, and this is speculation, I believe it was empty, Bill. I believe the B side has no days working. It was blank. So when he asked for the night in question, 612, this is what he received. And it's not a lie. It's accurate. He asked for the night of the murders. He got it. And when he worked on Monday night, he forgot to punch in, so he had to go back and fill out a card. He filled in the card, put in his Monday time, and then punched in but for But nobody else did, so you're saying, oh, I just happened to well, forget. And I'm and apart from that, it solves one of the problems I've always had with this time card. Why would it go from Sunday to Sunday? Right. That just makes no if sense it's a to If bi-weekly period, it always go Monday to Sunday on each side. Exactly. If that's true, and this is the date in question, right? Jason Simpson, in his testimony during deposition, said that he punched out that night. Right. When did you leave work? I think, I think it was around 10, 10, 30. Did you punch out? Yeah. And that's consistent with it. Confirms it. So, I mean, what it does for me is it takes one of the most questionable pieces of evidence regarding Jason's alibi and actually makes it one of the strongest because it puts him at work till 10, 20 p.m., five minutes after our witness would have seen him with O.J. at the crime scene. Wow. That's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. I know I know you don't like it, Bill, but I got to tell you. But you got to understand. It makes it's, perfect it's, it's, sense. There was something about the time card that had always intrigued Derek and I. It was like a nagging question. But I think he finally figured it all out.
You're making assumptions that you can't verify. No matter what you've said so far, it certainly hasn't convinced me that Jason Simpson was not involved. What about these three diaries? It's the year of the knife. I cut away my problems with a knife. What do you think of that? This is a man's private thoughts and struggles. That's how I see it. Further, when you look in these journals, there's no mention of Nicole Brown Simpson anywhere in there. But we also know what he did to Paul Gober. That he beat up and threat, I'll come back and cut you. I mean, that's a man who needs help. Absolutely. When we spoke with Paul Goldberg, it was a compelling story. But that's a big jump between an act of impulsive aggression and killing two people. That's book. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I may agree with some of the things you say, but I don't agree with that one. And remember what Michael Martin said, that Jason was at the Bundy address at the time of the murder. Frankly, I don't believe Michael Martin when he says that he identified Jason Simpson in the car. Oh, come Do I on. Believe we, can, we can go at that because okay. of the fact of the binoculars. He looked at it. Eh. We were out there at nighttime, very difficult to see. Oh. I, I question that. Do I listen to what you have to say? Absolutely. But I agree to disagree on this one. I, I want to I step in for a second because I want to make sure that we all know it's not about who's right and who's right. wrong. For me, I took the theory that we were originally going under at face value and, and believed it wholeheartedly. And what happened for me is as I was trying to fill in the pieces, logically, it didn't work. It's my opinion after reviewing all the evidence and talking to all these witnesses and taking a fresh look at this case that O.J. Simpson killed these two victims, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. I do not believe that Jason Simpson had any involvement in this crime. The evidence supports that. What now, evidence I'm... are you talking about? How can you be so conclusive with that? The amount of evidence surrounding this case was more than in most. You have the blood of Bundy. You have the blood of Nicole on his socks. You have his blood on the rear gate at Bundy. Blood, blood, and blood all over the place. You have Ronald Goldman's blood in his car. You have his his hair on Ron Goldman's shirt. By any stretch of the imagination, O.J. was not clean with his involvement. He didn't do a very good job of hiding anything. The wealth of evidence in this case is simply overwhelming. So what do you think, Derek? So as far as I'm concerned, Bill, I too believe that O.J. Simpson did kill Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson. However, based on the uncertain questions that we can't answer, the bloody shoe prints, the blood on the passenger side of the Bronco, uh, the second vehicle that was found at Rockingham by Allen Park, Michael Martin saying that there was someone else there, and OJ's own admission that he couldn't have done it alone. I still believe there's a strong possibility that someone may have been with OJ Simpson at some point during the night I of the said murder. That we may not agree on who that person is, but or what they did, or what they did there, there and when they did, or when they did it. But the bottom line is, none of us have sat here and said it was only OJ. No way it was anybody else. Not one of us. All three of us are from different backgrounds, from different generations, from different parts of the country, and we're all coming to the same conclusion that there's a strong possibility that there were two people at Bundy at one point during the night. Do you agree or disagree? I agree that there's a strong possibility that there was another person at Bundy that night. We might never know what each individual did during that night all we can really say that there's strong evidence to indicate that someone else was there and i think that in itself is incredible this case is still active uh, unfortunately although the evidence tells both me and chris that it couldn't have been jason i do think that there may have been a second person there but at minimum i take from this to make sure that i dot every i across every t in my own future investigations to make sure that 20 years from now people aren't questioning my work look we set out to do a job do we have a difference of opinion? You're damn right we do. You know, Bill didn't agree with us, but I respect a man who lets the truth come out as other people see it. And the more truth that comes out about the events of June 12, 1994, is going to be helpful to people that have a right to know. When we got into this thing, I said, is there something they've missed? And now there could have been a second. Absolutely. And that to me is important. In spite of our differences, I still think we've acquired enough new evidence to warrant a grand jury hearing. And I promise you this, I intend to damn well seek it. Okay. okay. Nicole Brown Simpson. I'm very glad that I was able to be here and spend this time with you because God knows where I'll be in a year. Ronald Lyle Goldman. On June the 12th, 1994, two lives were senselessly taken. Whatever the truth may be regarding these horrible crimes, one thing remains clear. We are all left to wonder.